and then make you the host. Okay. Okay, because you should be able to end the recording whenever. Um, I know that you have a hard stop, right? Yeah. So you can probably give yourself a couple of minutes of grace if, <laughs> if you feel okay. the conversation trailing off. You know what I mean? I think that should sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then I said, save it to my computer. So whenever you end the recording, it should still save on my computer. That's fine. Um, and then I think we can do uh, brief introductions. I'll talk a little bit about the concept and then I'll just let you guys run with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to start talking now, but <laughs> <laughs> we got to wait for Nina. Uh -huh. uh, what's new in your life? Nothing. I've just been busy with work and work and more work. That's pretty much it. Trying to not be so busy. Are you enjoying that? It. Mostly, yeah. I. It's just so like a lot of projects kind of dropped on my lap all at once. So really, it's just time to organize everything so I can make sure I spread it out enough to not yeah. overwhelm myself. So that's kind of what I'm doing now. Trying to make sense of things, but it's all exciting. You know, I'm I'm excited to work on these projects. It's just a lot of work right now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And when it rains, it pours. Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah. often think I don't know. I I try to not think this way, but I still operate within a scarcity mindset. You know, I'm like mm -hmm. I have to do all this work and take on these projects because, like, if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. Or like, mm -hmm. you know, it's not some crazy stuff. Um, that I work on with my therapists often, Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but I think that all the time and we don't have to do everything, you know, Yeah, we, like limit ourselves and respect our boundaries and like, yeah, you know, say, I think it. that's part of like working in an institution though. Like mm -hmm. I know what my limitations are, my boundaries are, but I have to make those clear to other people. And I'm still like, I mean, I've been here less than a year, so I'm still kind of figuring out that dynamic like balancing being able to do all of my work but also like making it clear that like there's only so much I can do in a certain time frame so I think it's still just like figuring out relationships you know how we work together with different people and there's so many people at this museum so mm -hmm. <laughs> it'll probably take a while to figure it all out but it's going good so far okay good I was gonna say yeah. gonna your time yeah yeah, we have some exciting things coming up that hopefully we'll be able to announce very soon. Okay. Um, I'm working on a few different projects with a few different departments. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's good stuff. It's a good experience. I think that um, being able to really work on the collection is going to be an exciting part of it because I haven't done that before. I've never oh. worked in a museum that had a permanent collection. So yeah, that's something I've really just been like studying the collection because they have I think like 60 something thousand pieces mm -hmm. um and then like my department african-american art has like 600 something so i've just been studying the collection trying to figure out like what is missing you know like any holes that i can feel or you know things like that so yeah that's that's been interesting i hope that maybe if it comes up that's a part of this discussion that you could pull in you know I yeah think sure another level of uh <clears throat> Of collecting it you know in general so it's not just like mm -hmm. collecting art objects in your home but thinking about a collection managing a collection stewarding it yeah. and like all of the labor and love that goes into that process mm -hmm. I don't know maybe like how it mirrors a personal collection and how it differs from you know how yeah. collection could be something that's interesting to discuss as well um this is the vacuum that just went on. Let me turn it off. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you for that. Sure. You know, it's these um, 
robot vacuums. I always think it's kind of like. Oh, that just go across the floor for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little scary. <laughs> uh, okay, perfect timing. Hey, Nina. Oh, we can't hear you. Uh oh. You're on mute. Hey, hey guys. Hey. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh running today as always. I'm sure you guys are too. Yeah. <laughs> well, Nina, you look lovely. Now I can Oh, I put on lipstick for you. That was my last act. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is James joining us too or is it just us today? It's just us. Okay, perfect. He okay. decided that he couldn't. Uh, he decided he wouldn't add a lot, and so he uh, he decided to pr keep pursuing what he had to do. I understand. Uh, I always love James's company, but it's absolutely no problem at all. So let's get started. Hi, thank you so much, you guys, for being here today. Great excited about this. Um, I want to just do brief introductions because you haven't had the chance to meet each other yet. So these can be really short and to not take up too much time. Uh, Nina, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I, is it now to pronounce your name for me? Is it Juana or how do you pronounce your name? It's Juana. You said it right the first time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's Juana. Okay, beautiful. Okay. I'm Nina Ford Jackson. And I um when people say that I am an art collector, Juana, I feel a little bit like mm, maybe not. But when I was thinking about how to prepare for this, I thought, well, maybe I really am. So I have always loved art. We live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we have lived here three different times and have been back here for a while. And everywhere that I've lived, I've I managed to meet artists, fall in love with artists, buy art. Um, and so I think I am totally an art collector. I'm the oldest of four children. I'm from North Carolina. And, um, you know, that that being the oldest and being from North Carolina informs pretty much everything that um, I have I have done. So I'm very happy to meet you. I hear that you are a serious major contributing collector. I am not that girl. <laughs> I am the girl who collects art that I like to live with. OK, mm -hmm. so totally different. Nice to meet you. Oh, it's nice meeting you too. Um, I'm based in Detroit and I work as an art curator, but I also have a personal collection. So I guess we can kind of talk about both of those because um, part of my responsibility at the museum is to collect for the museum's collection. It's a very different experience. Um, both of my parents were artists. Yeah. And so that's kind of how I got interested in it. Although when I first went to college, I was a math major and I was just sure that I was going to do everything but art. Um, I ended up <laughs> changing my mind and I have a BA in art and fine art and then I went to graduate school and I have a master's in art history um, and I've worked at a few different galleries and museums so right now I'm at a museum called Detroit Institute of Arts um, and it's probably like the biggest museum in Michigan we have a, a pretty substantial collection there are a lot of curators here in a lot of different departments I've been here a little under a year so there's still a ton for me to learn but I'm really excited to be here um, and excited about the work that I've been doing and excited to have this conversation with you today. Wow, that was perfect. I feel like I don't want to say great. much. Um, you all know the framework for today is just, this is a casual conversation. It's already successful just because this bridge that's been created between the two of you. So if there's if there's any tension or anxiety about like, is this going to be good? You can release that. It's already great. Um, I can't wait for you all to meet in person and have a continued conversation from this starting point. So I've handed the keys to Juana already. So whenever you finish the conversation a little bit before three, go ahead and just click stop recording. And then it will download onto my computer. As you know, we're going to transcribe it. Excerpts of it will live on the exhibition catalog and maybe in permanent sites of the physical space. Um, okay. And then it will also exist uh, online for folks to read. So uh, cheers. I hope you guys enjoy each other and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay, see you later. So I don't, well, great. So it's as oh, if we're happy. Sorry. No, go, go ahead. ahead. You go ahead. I was just gonna say I, I don't think that we have any specifics that we have to discuss. So however we want to have the conversation is fine. 
Okay, so I think what I would prefer to be doing with you, Juana, is going to lunch. So mm -hmm. since we can't do that, and let's just have our lunch conversation. Okay. Just, just um, we'll talk. I will just act like I would if we were having lunch together. Mm -hmm. So, um, I will just say, you know, it is really so exciting for me to sit with you because I love art, and I love people who love art. Mm -hmm. And you know, and there are people. There's so many people who, you know, they say they like art and they sort of like art, and but really, you can just tell that. They, they can see, we can have lunch at a beautiful place that's full of art. And I have to get up and go see the art first before I can start mm -hmm. <laughs> the lunch. I just have to do that. And uh, there are people who I know who we go to beautiful places and there's great art around and they don't even notice it. So I just love um, talking with artists and I love talking with people who love art because I think there is, a as Jessica said, there's some kind of a bridge there, whatever the connection is. Yours is really, really obvious that both of your parents were artists. You were just immersed in it before you knew mm -hmm. how to talk. That's what you, that's what you did. And so when I was trying to prepare for today, I realized, I said, let me just at least think about how I really did come to love art um, and black art in particular, but I, I love all art, but black art is what I kind of try to concentrate on because I want to support black artists. I want to support having black images and objects in my home. And so I'm intentional now in a way that I hadn't been all my life about, you know, African American art and and black art in general. But I realized that my father also was an artist of sorts. He was mm -hmm. a teacher and he taught industrial arts. And so back in the 40s, he got a degree in industrial arts education, I guess, from Hampton Institute, it was called then. And so daddy was, and he wanted to be an architect. Things happened and he couldn't, he started in graduate school, in architecture school, and he had to quit to get a job to help take care of his mom who was sick. So he never became an architect, but he has that, um, he had that kind of a sensibility. He, um, he, he made things, he built our furniture, he built parts of our house. He always, so we grew up, not even understanding that we love things that were made by hand. Um, mm -hmm. And we preferred things that were made by hand and we recognized things that were made by hand. So his artistry was woodworking, you know, was a woodworking mm -hmm. kind of artistry. And one of my most prized possessions is a thing he, he carved my senior year in high school, he carved it. And when he passed away and we started dividing up things, that was the thing that I wanted. And everybody was my family members were sure you should have that because you're the one who appreciates that. So my mm -hmm. dad was an artist of sort. And then when I think about my mom, she loved doing um, floral design and she loved doing quilting. And so when I thought about that, I went, that's an art form as well. I now buy quilted pieces and all of that. So my parents were artists too, not in the sense that yours were, but certainly they were very artistic and contributed to my liking things that had a, have a hand, a feel of a, of a hand. So I think we yeah. have that in common. Well, I think my story is actually kind of similar. I say my parents are artists, but they weren't, that wasn't their full-time job. They weren't practicing artists in terms of exhibiting and, you know, the way that we understand the word artist today. Um, and when I was growing up, you know, my parents were creative, but I never really thought anything of it. It was just like, you know, normal life to me when my mom was making something or, you know, my dad was taking photographs. Um, but because they weren't, you know, calling themselves artists and they weren't exhibiting work and things like that, I never really thought of it that way until I was an adult. And I think when I especially started working as a curator, um, I started thinking about the definition of artists mm -hmm. differently because you don't have to exhibit to be an artist. You know, even if you're not making work for a while, you can still be an artist, you know, as a creative person, if that's how you identify, that's fine. So I've recently, I would say in the last maybe year or two, actually just started saying my parents were artists um, because I finally like recognized that that definition can be so much more open than I understood it before. And it's funny that you say your mom made quilts because my mom makes quilts too. She's a fiber artist. She makes quilts. She makes dolls. She can pretty much sew anything. And that came from my grandfather was a tailor. And so, you know, he taught her how, you know, to pretty much just like him clothing and, you know, 
read patterns and things like that. And so she grew up being able to make clothing. And then as an adult, kind of on the side, she would do, you know, more creative things that were more interesting to her. But she was actually a public school teacher my whole life. She taught math, not art. So that was really interesting, you know, um, but she's always had that creative side to her just from being able to make clothing as a child. Um, and then my dad did photography and I don't think that he would ever consider himself an artist or photographer. It was just something he was interested in. But I went to school for photography and I started to ask my family a lot of questions because that became an interest of mine. And I was actually able to go to the store where he would get his film and get um, his pictures produced. And so that was a really interesting experience to have that mm -hmm. connection as an adult, because when he was a child, I never would have thought like, where do you buy film and where did you get your camera from? Like, I never would have asked that question. But when I became interested in photography, um, it felt really natural to me. And I was like, why have I chosen photography as opposed to like painting or drawing or sculpting? And I really do think that it was because I grew up around photography so much and, you know, didn't recognize that connection. But um, I definitely feel like in the same sense that you were saying, like, my parents are artists, but not in the traditional sense. They didn't you like go to school to be artists or exhibit, but they were still very creative people. And that became sort of a part of who I was, even if I didn't realize that was happening. That's exactly right. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. So I was also thinking back to when I was a, a youngster, when we would go on vacation, one of the things that my dad would do would be we didn't have a ton of money we, we were fine but we didn't have a ton of money but one of the things that daddy would do would be to give everybody their vacation money so you had your vacation money and you could do with your vacation money what you wanted to do if you wanted to uh upgrade your meals at the restaurants um you could do that my brother would always you know get something fabulous for dinner he'd get lobster or whatever but I always knew and my sisters maybe liked souvenirs and that kind of thing but I always knew that I wanted to save my money I would just eat the basics whatever dad and mama would pay for for dinner I would eat that and um I didn't want any little tchotchke souvenirs or whatever I mm -hmm. wanted to find an object or an image or something that I could bring back. It didn't have to be, if we were in New York, it didn't have to be a New York thing. If we were in Florida, it didn't have to be a Florida thing, but I wanted to bring back something that reminded me of the trip maybe, or something that I would want to keep forever. And so I was the person who <laughs> would bring back the fabulous seashell that I bought in a store. And I remember them would say, you paid $10 for a seashell or, you know, you paid, five dollars for that piece of you know it, it's just a postcard but to me it was a postcard that had something beautiful on it so mm -hmm. I would um so I think I was collecting even then and I didn't realize it because I didn't you know I wasn't gonna spend it on dinner or something I wanted to have something that I can keep and even now a lot of my friends love vacations and experiences and that kind of stuff and I'm fine with that but I like an object. I like an image. I like a painting that I can see every day or that I can walk <laughs> past or a sculpture or something that I can live with. Mm -hmm. So I think I started collecting art because I wanted things that I could live with every day that made me happy, that I could feel that someone, like I said, had had their hand on it and someone had done the work. And you can see a little imperfection or a, a thumbprint sometimes or something like I love that. And so I started collecting art from a very young age because I just wanted to live with it. And that's still how mm -hmm. I am. And like I said, it was later that I got intentional about it being, um, I started when I started sort of thinking, okay, I'm going to spend, you know, some, not just tiny bit of money, but I'm going to make this a part of what I spend my money on. I remember thinking I wanted to um, buy things that were either by African-American artists or African or Black artists or that were of Black subjects. So some of my earlier things and some of my things now um, are things that are of African-American um, culture that about mm -hmm. it, but aren't necessarily um, done by African-American people. So that mm -hmm. was kind of, I started out being it needed to be, and I think it was just, I wanted to live with things that made me happy and that things I was attracted to. And so it ended up, that's what I was attracted to. And so that's kind of how I started with the, um, with the black art, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. 
What about yeah. you? I think I, I can't remember the first piece I collected, but I think that I started collecting after I started working in this world, in the art world. And mm -hmm. I started just collecting work from my friends. A lot of my friends are artists because that's who I'm around all the time. That's um, right. I really think for me, uh, my interest in collecting was more so to support artists because right. a lot of the pieces that I bought, especially in the beginning, were by emerging artists or like college students or people who really were like, you buy my work and I can pay my rent or, you know, you buy my work and I can buy lunch today or whatever. So, I mean, yeah. I do I have always chosen works that spoke to me or that I thought were beautiful or important or profound. Like I wouldn't just buy something just because I know the artist, but. I do choose which artists to buy from based on, or at least in the beginning, based on knowing them. Um, and so just being, being able to support them. But I think it came later for me recognizing the value of having artwork in my home. Um, mm -hmm. We had artwork up in our house growing up, but like I said, I really just ignored it. Like it just felt like furniture to me. Like it was a normal thing because it was always there. But I think when I had my own house, and I started making those decisions of how to decorate it and what I wanted to put on the wall and things like that. You really like have a different feeling when it's artwork on the wall, especially if yeah. that's artwork that means something to you. Like I handpicked this piece because I felt like this made sense in my living room. And, you know, I want my family to see this when they come over. Um, I think now I'm thinking a lot about my children. I have three kids. Um, and so I think a lot about how art impacts their lives yeah. and, I think it's really interesting because they all are very creative people. Like at home, I always have tons of art supplies everywhere and they can make art whenever they want to. Like there are no rules or anything like that. But I feel like once I started putting art on the walls, something shifted. Like they have feelings and opinions about the artwork, even the little, little, little ones. And that's really interesting to me because as an art historian, <clears throat> you know, part of my responsibility is to experience artwork and like try to change or try to explain it or try to put it into context of history or you know try to think about the conceptual technical aspects like it's it's so much like a different perspective than a little kid like they look at it and their their opinions are so their experiences are like so visceral like it's just perfectly in that moment this is how I feel when I see this and there's no background necessarily or there's no like I read this article about it or whatever so I think that's when it really became like super enjoyable for me to like see my kids respond to the artwork. Um, yeah. And it's really funny because sometimes they don't like it. Sometimes they're like, why did you buy that? <laughs> and I think that's so funny because I have all my reasons and I'm like, what are you talking about? I love this piece. And then they say like one sentence, they're like, no, you shouldn't have bought that. So <laughs> that's always a funny experience. I have this one piece <clears throat> um, where it's a figurative work and the person is like, really staring out to the viewer and we had it in our dining room for a while and my kids would just say why does that have to be in here it feels like he's staring at me while I'm eating and so <laughs> I was like, okay, maybe we should put this in a different space in the house but I think just like starting those conversations like the artwork that I buy they always notice when a new piece goes up and they always have an opinion about it and it starts interesting conversations and that's a big part of the work I do as a curator like part of why I want to curate exhibitions and put artwork together is to create those spaces for conversation. Um, yeah. I do focus, I would I call myself a contemporary curator, but right now in my role, I definitely focus more on um, African-American art, art of the African diaspora. Mm -hmm. And so just thinking about the connections between um, people, you know, who have heritage in the African diaspora and those conversations that even need to happen now. Um, yeah. I think that museums and galleries give that platform to sort of start those conversations. So oftentimes, um, you know, there may be things that are happening in the world and people don't really know how to discuss them or know how to like initiate those conversations. And I think that art in a lot of ways gives that space to do that. And then, you know, you can take the conversation wherever it goes. But um, I think that's one part that I'm realizing sort of parallels my personal life and my personal collection and then my work life and you know the collection at the museum yes yes i i totally agree and when it comes to the way i experience art i am more like your children okay <laughs> i either love it or i can or i don't mm -hmm. and i only basically buy things that i love or to your point 
sometimes I will buy things that I don't necessarily love because I want to support the artist. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I do that as well. And this, the actually the what's it called the diptych that I have behind me. Yeah, I, I really love it now. But when I bought it, I was supporting an artist friend of mine. It was back in the nineties. Mm -hmm. no, 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 no. It was in the two thousand. Let's see. I think that's oh eight. I was no, it was not oh eight. Oh four. I was supporting an artist friend of mine who I bought things from and I love her art, like loved it, loved it. May she rest in peace. Um, loved her art and I would buy things from her. And she was the type artists love you when you appreciate their work too. That's the mm -hmm. other things. They give you so much good energy and reinforcement for supporting them. So my friend, the late Justine Alexander, who was a self-taught artist, um, kind of folk art, I loved her things. And I remember I got, I commissioned her to do a piece for my husband for a birthday. I can't remember what, what birthday it was, but it was a birthday. And um, she she didn't have anything that she thought would be good for his birthday. But she said, you know, I could, I could paint you something. I said, great. So I said, you know, what do you want me to, what do you want me to paint? She asked me. And I said, just, you know him kind of, what do you think? And so my husband was a banker. And she said, you know, I want to paint something about what he's going through and how he's doing. And so she painted a really great piece that looked like, um, and it, you know, sort of remind you of the enslaved, of an enslaved man. And it was scars, you know, she had scars on his back. She was like, because I know the things that he's trying to do up in that bank, trying to, you know, he's feeling like mm -hmm. this kind of thing. And so it was a great piece. And, um, love it and he loved it and I said well Justine how much and she's like you know oh girl just you know just give me what you think just give me what you think and I remember mm -hmm. what I gave her and it was it was fine I thought it was fair I thought it was maybe a little bit more generous than fair but I wanted to you know bless her and let her know that I appreciated it when I paid her she dissolved in tears she literally just dissolved in tears she said Nina no one has ever paid me that kind of money she said, no one has ever paid me that kind of money. And she said, and it's not the money. She said, you know, I need the money. And she did. She said, you know, I need the money and I'm going to use the money. She said, but the fact that you think that much of something that I did, I just, I'm, she was overwhelmed by it. So, and she was the first person artist who I knew, who I, you know, I knew her. She painted for me and we exchanged that way. She would not put a price on it. And so with Justine, every time I would pay her a thousand dollars for something, she'd probably give me two thousand dollars worth of stuff for free. You know, she mm -hmm. was just she was so appreciated. She wasn't really represented by but you know, she was that self-taught, just trying to make it kind of artist. And so through Justine, I fell in love with not only art. But then I fell in love with artists as well and the energy and the appreciation that they have for someone getting their expression of, you know, of the world. And so mm -hmm. that was um, great with Justine. So Justine took me to a thing with some of her friends who were artists trying to make it not represent it kind of thing. And so I bought the painting, uh, the diptych behind me at that point just to support, liked it, didn't love it. And then I, I got it back home. And years later, I realized that to me, it looks like a sharecropper family in a little mm -hmm. house. And it looks like, you know, the, the, the ones who are sitting together are fine. They're not, you know, elated or thrilled or anything, but they're okay. And they, they take their lot in life. They're little, the, the little ones are fine. And, but then there's that other one sitting over on the side who is like, I'm looking in another direction. I'm not feeling this. This is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. I'm kind of out of here. And that was my father. My father mm -hmm. grew up in a family of sharecroppers and he was the oldest and he loved them and everything. But at a certain point um, in defiance, unfortunately, of his father, he, he said, I have to go, you know, I got to get out of here. And so he found his way to go to college. And I thought, I didn't realize it, but this is a painting that reminds me of my family, of my, of my heritage. And so it has become a favorite of mine, but for the most part, I'm like your kids. If I see it and I love it, 
that's the one I buy. I don't go too much deeper than that. Um, and, and so this, but this was a departure, but of the pe of the pieces, I was attracted to it and I was attracted to it because of one of my uh, life experiences that I wasn't even thinking about at the time. Mm -hmm. I think that's so interesting that you said that because I always think of sort of this two-way conversation with art, like the artist is creating something from their experiences and from their understanding of the world and what they want people to know or people to see, but then yeah. they don't necessarily have control over that, right? The viewer comes in and they get to look at the work and they bring all their baggage with them. They bring their experiences, they bring their relationships with their parents or partners or whatever. And so it's not necessarily that, um, you know, that experience that the artist wanted them to have or their intention behind it. <clears throat> and so I think that's interesting because I mean, I don't know if you've had this conversation with her, but I imagine that she didn't create this work thinking about your family. You know, she was thinking about whatever she was thinking about when she created it. But for you as the viewer and the person who purchased this for your collection, you have a completely different understanding of it. And I feel like that's kind of the beauty of, of visual art. We get right. to interpret the work the way that it makes sense for us. Um, that's right. And I think that's really interesting. And I think that's part of why curating is so enjoyable for me. Yes. because I mean like there's all there's like layers to it of course there's a layer of me as a viewer I get to you know interpret the work based on that but also just like thinking about my training as an art historian thinking about the research I've done in the past and the research I do on specific pieces you know I think about have I had a conversation with this artist and have they talked to me about this specific piece like there's so much that goes into it and so sometimes I get to sort of be that middle point you know like the artist has an intention of how they want their work understood. And then the viewer comes in and, you know, they understood it, stand it based on their experiences. But as the curator, sometimes I get to kind of help with that story. Like I get to narrate a, a conversation mm -hmm. in a sense. And um, I think that maybe it's like part of what makes artwork so interesting to me and what draws me to it, like that complexity of it. The fact that you can, it can be 20 people looking at this work of art and you all have different understandings of it. You know, like if I look at that, I don't necessarily think about, you know, how my father went to college and, you know, decided to live a different life than his family because that's not my story, but that makes right. sense to you. So I don't know. I just think that there's really um, such a beauty in that. And it's really illuminating to hear other people's perspectives. And I think that's why I enjoy listening to children talk about artwork so much, um, yes. but even just anybody, you know, because I think that in a sense, I don't have that innocence. Like I don't have the innocence to say like, I don't know what an oil painting is. I have no idea how they made this, but I like it. And that's enough. You know what I mean? Like, I kind of think that a, um, there's like a freedom in that, you know, being able to just say, I know what I like and I know what I don't. And just, you know, it is what it is. And I think that um, that's right. sometimes for my personal collection, it works that way because I don't have to explain it to anyone. You know, if something just means something to me, then I just, you know, it just means something to me. And that's enough for me to purchase it or to want to support that artists by buying their their artwork and I don't have to say this piece is important to my whole collection because it fills this gap or you know for this particular reason I think um there's a lot more freedom in like my personal collection and I can make these decisions just based on what makes sense to me in the moment um and I yeah. feel like we all have those experiences like regardless of your level of understanding or studying art or if you're an artist or not like everyone can look at a work of art or experience a work of art and have an opinion about it. And I think like in the work that I do, especially early on, um, that was really important to me because even though my my parents are creative people, I wouldn't say I necessarily grew up in like an art focused household or an art focused like community. Art wasn't really something that was, I guess like taken seriously. Like I wasn't at the museum every weekend or you know making artwork at home with my family. And so when I grew up and started working in this industry, I felt like there was a huge divide between um, who feels comfortable in these spaces, in museums yes. and in galleries, and then who also feels like they have the right to even discuss artwork. Because some people feel so uncomfortable, like, I don't know anything about this, and so it's not my place, you know, That's to right. have an opinion, or it's not my place to talk about it. And so a lot of the work that I do is to just try to talk to people who don't necessarily have this background who you know didn't necessarily grow up seeing artwork and don't feel comfortable in these spaces and tell them like your opinion is just as valid as anyone else's 
you know, like whatever you feel about the artwork is incredibly important. And you shouldn't feel like, you know, because this is your first time at a museum that you don't get to say anything. Like, I think that most artists recognize that once your art is in the public, literally anyone can experience it and they all get to have, you know, an opinion about it. And um, I don't know, I think that that's something that I really, from the very beginning of my career, wanted to make sure I centered. So even when I'm creating exhibitions, I always try to think about who my audience is and who I want my audience to be. Um, yes. Because sometimes those don't align. Sometimes, you know, I want anyone to be feel welcome to the show, but that's not necessarily who feels comfortable coming. And so I always try to figure out ways to connect to communities and to bring people into spaces um, that haven't been to these spaces before or, you know, don't feel comfortable in these spaces. So I think like tying it back to the way that you collect, I think it's interesting because you choose work that is important to you and it makes you feel something. And so mm -hmm. I think that, you know, even for people who don't have personal collections, just like being around art, I think can really impact people as long yes. as they're like open to it. So I always try to encourage people, like when you go to an exhibition, make sure you go as open as you can be and you don't go with like this yeah. intention of understanding the work in a certain way or expecting a certain thing from the artist's production like definitely go and try to be open and understand the perspective of the artist in conjunction with your own experiences and what you bring to it i think that that is so um it just rings a lot of bells with me because i have friends who come to my house, which is full of art all the time. And I, I move it around and everything. A guy told me one time, a, a, a decorator, when mm -hmm. in my uh, adult life, I moved a lot. And so when I came to Charlotte the second time, there was a guy who had just won um, third place or something on this show called Design Star or something. His name's Will Smith. He's an African-American designer. And I um, purchased a one hour consultation with him. Uh, to do some design stuff. And it was, um, he came to my house and I purchased it and he came and he said, and I had paintings on the floor and everything. And I was asking him about bedspreads and stuff like that. And he said to me, and it was, it really was so good. He said, you obviously love art. He said, your home should feel like an art gallery. He said, mm -hmm. that's how you, you should, um, people should come to your house and they should experience like a an inviting art gallery. And I thought, I do like art. Why am I sitting here trying to decide, do I hang this one or do I hang this one or whatever? He basically said, hang all of them, you know? <laughs> and so that sort of changed um, the way I look at it. And so I do, I'd like to have my house just, the art welcomes people. And so people come to my, my house and they, they love the art and they talk about it and they, um, and I said, well, well, who do you, do you have artists that you like? Or, well, I don't know anything about, you know, I don't know anything about mm -hmm. art. That's not my thing. That's your thing. I don't know anything about art. I said, I don't know anything about art either. I said, I love to decorate my house. I said, and there used to be a joke that artists would say at 90, you don't go and you buy, um, you can't go and buy a painting to uh, match your sofa. I said, I have now become the girl who buys the sofa to match the painting. So, um, <laughs> yeah. and so it's, it's, it's like you, I said, you have to buy what you like. And I mm -hmm. say, go to art galleries, go to exhibitions and people do feel afraid of doing that. I'm yeah. talking grown people, educated people, wealthy people, they still don't know. They're afraid to not know. And like you said, mm -hmm. in that space, they don't know how to conquer that space. They don't know how to feel feel like they're on top of that space. So they kind of avoid the space. And I say, y'all just buy what you like. Just go and see it. You don't have to buy anything. The first time you go to, you know, an art exhibition or anything, you don't have to buy anything. But if you love something, just buy it. And if you love it, you will want to live with it and you can find a place for it. So I think you're right in that you're trying to make art more accessible for everybody. Yeah. Um, so that people aren't like art, ooh, this whole thing. I mean, people think art and they think uh, Vincent Van Gogh or something, you know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be all that. Like you said, our friends are making art. We have, I now love to meet the artists and try to support the artists, but just become friends with the artists because I like mm -hmm. artist energy. Um, and Charlotte, um, believe it or not, I don't know if you've been to Charlotte, 
but Charlotte is a hub for art and artists. A mm -hmm. lot of people come through here and a lot of the art that um, the contemporary artists who I have met, you know, the, the current artists, African-American people making art now, I met through an exhibition that Jessica did with one of my very best friends, a Bulgarian young woman named Irina, who um, had an art gallery. And this is funny, in my life, I'm like the Forrest Gump when it comes to art. An art gallery came and just opened up right uh, in my back, in my front door, in my front yeah. door. So it's right here. I live in a condo building and she opened um, an art gallery right steps from where I live. And mm -hmm. so we became friends and she, Jessica, and she did a show back several years ago, pre-pandemic called Black Blooded. And in Black Blooded, um, the, you know, lots of young artists. I mm -hmm. think you're you're in Detroit, so you know um, Mario mm -hmm. um, and uh, Cheryl Rowland and just a lot of um, young African-American artists, artists of color came um, as a part of that exhibition. And so I met um, I met a lot of them and I just love, like you said, I love, um, I love all art, you know, but I love meeting the, the the young artist and trying to support them and just being a part of what they're thinking now and how art is moving and changing. I love figurative things, but I also love installation art. I love abstract art. I love objects. I love sculpture. I love performance art. John Love is an artist here in Charlotte. He's um He does everything, but he also does performance art. He is the best guy mm -hmm. ever. So interesting. Um, and and so I I love it, but you're right. There's so many people who deprive themselves of art because they think they have to master it before they yeah. can buy a painting or go to an exhibition. And that's mm -hmm. I'm glad you're trying to change that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love what you said about um, people come to your house and they're like, I don't know anything about art. That's your thing, and you encourage them. Like neither do I, but you know, look at my house, yeah. look at my collection. You can still appreciate it. Um, Something funny that kind of started in my, like the early part of my career was I would post artwork to social media because I love art and that was what I was interested in. And, um, you know, before I really had a platform, before I had a, you know, a position at an institution, like as a graduate student, I would just post things that I was researching or interested in and post like a little blurb to kind of ex <clears throat> explain the artwork or I would, you know, put a little background information about the artist. And so many of my family members and friends who never, ever had any interest in art were just like, now that you're starting to post art, I actually went to the museum or I took my kids to the museum or, you know, like I went to this exhibition and, you know, over time, over the years, they started, you know, really becoming part of that culture, like going to art openings and, that, and they didn't even know our opening was a thing, you know, two or three years ago. Right. Um, <laughs> or even like collecting artwork, which they never considered to be a part of their life. Like they never imagined that that would be a part of their life. And I think, um, you know, like obviously in my full-time work, I do this, but I think it's also really important in like personal relationships to be able to talk to people about artwork and to be able to encourage them <clears throat> to experience it. Because I mean, these are like everybody from like my younger cousins to like my great aunts and uncles who are like 60, 70 years old that'll say like, I literally have never been to a museum, but you keep posting all this amazing stuff that I never knew existed. So I had to go. Um, exactly. And that's so, I think that's so awesome. And I mean, in the same way that you have your artwork up and you're like, I want to put up everything because I love it all. When your <laughs> exactly. friends come over, you know, they get to see this artwork and they could get to recognize that um, this is not just something that's outside of them. Like this art world is not something that they have to remain, you know, out the doors of, they can come in, they can be a part of it, they can have a conversation about it, they can say they like it or they don't. Um, and I think like having people in their lives to not just encourage that with their words, but also like with, you know, your actions in terms of collecting artwork and hanging it up in your house, you know, like that's your personal space. Like people yes. get to make, you know, make very um, personal and intimate decisions about what they want to live with every day. Like you have to see this all the time, you know? And so, you know, I think that being able to bring like family members and friends into this love of art with me has been like rewarding in a very surprising way. Like I never expected that because I always like post, 
random things to social media because that's what I like. And I'm like, maybe somebody else does too. Maybe they don't. I don't know. But I'll post it because I'm interested in it. And so, you know, for someone to respond and for me to get so many responses over the years, you know, to say like art is a part of their life now because I shared it with them, I think is um, yeah. is really validating and not just in the work that I do, but just like this is a huge interest of me personally. So to be able to share that with people I care about, I think has been you know, a really exciting part of this practice. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I just love, you know, I love that you're sharing it with people and younger people mm -hmm. so that, you know, don't waste a whole lifetime. <laughs> don't wait to be 50, 60 years old before you say, I think I'm going to now step out on faith and buy a painting, you know, just, yeah. just do it. If you love it, get it. I have a friend, a good friend of mine, um, who is a textile artist now. Her name is Linda mm -hmm. Baker Keene. And one of her pieces is going to be a part of my um, room at the um, at the uh, vault that Jessica is doing okay. here at the exhibition at the Mint Museum. And Linda is such a cool example of just living a lifetime of art. And when you were talking about your um, parents and how your mom came to art, Linda told me that her story, Linda... Um, is, you know, a Harvard MBA type person. Mm -hmm. And um, she told me that her story coming into art, this is her third act, she calls it. Her first act was highly corporate doing something. Her second act, I think she worked for um, not-for-profits doing mm -hmm. um, you know, management work with not-for-profits. And then her third act, she decided, I want to do art, um, actually make art and um represent you know sell art and put art out in the world and she uses the money that she makes from the art to support um hbcu's part of it is what she does oh. so it's a great thing that she does but mm -hmm. she said that her mother and her grandmother both i think were excellent seamstresses and um she came to you know know how the the value of you know doing things with your hands and the value of making things perfectly well and so she does these um pieces now lots of uh different she does legacy pieces she'll take mm -hmm. a portrait of of people's family and she will quilt it and put it to a quilt painting and she does all those things and so one of the things that she did and I told Linda I, I have received a lot of good gifts in my life I love gifts I have had artists give me great gifts. Like I said, artists, when they know that you love their art and you buy their art, then they want to give you art. Or back in the mm -hmm. day, hopefully that's changed a little bit now. And, and the younger people know, no, I can just sell my art to you. Now. It's <laughs> fine. We can, we can still be friends and I can sell it to you. But my friend Linda, um, back in 2020 during the pandemic, um, she made these beautiful Black Santa cards. And um, she had this wonderful black Santa and on the card on the top of it said 2020. Well, in 2020, Christmas was a whole thing, you know, because we were all, can I get together? Can can Santa Claus come? You know, what what's the deal? What can we do in 2020? And so Linda made these beautiful, this black Santa, you know, quilt thing and she made it into cards and I bought probably a hundred of them and sent them to everybody. And um so we become good friends and I, you know, I support her art and love her art and give people her art and keep it for myself. And mm -hmm. so this Christmas, she said, I don't know what I could ever give you. And she gave me the prototype for the Christmas cards. So it is like literally, oh my goodness. Yes. I said, Linda, this is the best gift anybody <laughs> ever gave me, like literally. Mm -hmm. um, I love it. As a part of the vault, um, exhibition that I'm doing. And like I said, because I am the, the artist who represent, well, in this exhibition, they have, I think she has four or five different artists and each of okay. us represents a different way, not artists, four or five different collectors. And each of us represents um, a different reason or method for collecting, for being a you know collector of African-American art. And so I think that I am the person who collects because I want to live with it. And I want to live with what I love. And so one of the things that I started collecting back in the 90s or the 80s as a young woman um, was Black Santas. And it was kind of, you know, I was fortunate enough to come of age at a time when that was, you know, Black, black art was becoming accessible to the public. Prior to that, from my experience, 
unless you were in the art world and you knew a whole lot, there wasn't a proliferation of black art that the masses could afford to buy and purchase mm -hmm. and had access to. So we would go to New Orleans and particularly New Orleans and places like that. And we would find really cool, quote unquote, black art, Barnett Honeywood and um, those kind of folks that we, you know, uh, came to know, Brenda Joy Smith and those kind of uh, names. And so, but if, I lived in Tampa, Florida at the time and mm -hmm. Tampa would have this, um, this crafts fair, this, you know, arts and crafts, uh, fair. And I would go to it. My best friend, Hosetta, and I were like the only two African-American women at the time who would go yeah. to that. And there were people, several people who at that time were making black Christmas things. They were making mm -hmm. black Christmas ornaments and Santas and that kind of thing. And so I bought, you know, Santas through the years thinking that I would, and I would always buy, maybe buy one a year, thinking that I was going to have a lifetime to collect these really cool handmade um, black Santa as well, that kind of phased out after a while. I don't know if it wasn't profitable, if the political climate changed, I don't know what happened, but that sort of phased out. And so there is not as much opportunity to buy now the handmade really cool ones as there, as it was before. So part of what I am doing, what Jessica picked for me to do in this art exhibition is display in a room on a mantle my Black Santa collection. And mm -hmm. so I'm so excited when she, and she didn't know this, but um, when she gave me that piece, so now over the mantle somewhere is going to be the piece that my friend made with the, um, the the quilted piece that she made with the Black Santa. Mm -hmm. So that's part of, she, I think Jessica told me she wanted us to talk about our relationships with artists. And clearly you have friendship relationship and you have a, a career relationship with artists. My relationship is just like I have said, um, I just love the energy. I love the mm -hmm. creative, I love creative people. I love the energy. And um, I find myself always befriending pretty much if I like their art, <laughs> I'm going to like, there's something about the art that attracts me to them. And like I said, I've never been rebuffed by an artist. Typically, if you like their stuff, they're going to appreciate that you like their stuff. And so I have lots of, um, you know, acquaintances and friends through the years who are artists and I try to support them. I think she also mm -hmm. said she wanted us to talk a little bit about art as a legacy. And so that's probably more your um, your thing because I, mm -hmm. I, I haven't really thought a lot about um, the legacy of my art. I've donated to um, the Gantt Museum a couple of pieces. Um, okay. The, to the Gantt Museum and um, I've donated to um, fundraisers when my young friends are doing fundraisers for UNCF mm -hmm. and Jack and Jill and that kind of thing. I've donated art to places like that and I give um, art that I've uh, collected through the years. I give it to my new, fr my young friends who are, you know, moving into their first home or just got married. I think I love giving art as wedding presents. Um, oh, that's so, sweet. so that kind of thing. So that's part of the legacy. Oh, I, I love doing that. Um, mm -hmm. to just to let people know, like you said, that you can live with it. You can live with this nice piece of art. I mean, it's not a masterpiece, but it's an original piece of art that reminds me of you or your wedding or your relationship or something about you. And people, they, you know, totally um, appreciate it. And I think it, to your point, I think it starts some people understanding that you can you can buy what you like and it's fine it'll look it'll look nice and you'll continue to like it yeah yeah I think to your point about how you're friends with artists you become friends with artists and you like their energy um I always feel like artists are very courageous people because in our yeah. culture that career path is not necessarily highlighted it's not necessarily supported yeah. all the time like I definitely don't remember any of my teachers saying like you should be an artist when you grow up it was always like sure. be a doctor be a lawyer be a teacher be a you know everything but artist and even um you know I remember when I I would say like probably my early 20s um when I was an undergrad and I decided to switch my major to art you know, my mom was like, back when I was a kid, like nobody supported women being artists. Like that wasn't even a career you could think about, you could consider. And I, I mean, I think times have definitely changed, but I think it's still very difficult to be an artist. I mean, like 
it's essentially entrepreneurial work. You have yes. to figure out how not just to make the work, but how to promote it, how to get people to see it, how to get people to buy it. Like it's such a complex field to just jump into um, and to stay in because, you know, like you have to deal with the art market and to, to a sense um, yeah. and that it could be volatile, you know, like right now, a lot of people like black art, but that has not always been true. And I always think about um, like artists who are making work in like the 60s and 70s, like the civil rights era, and even before that, like black artists are not being supported and they had to figure out ways to support themselves or each other. They came together and made artist groups and, you know, like, um, you know, started galleries or started museums. Like that's around the time where a lot of the museums that are focused on the African diaspora started because there is literally nowhere else that they could show their work. And so I, you know, I think that, like I said, times have changed for sure, but this still to me feels like a very courageous move to say like, I am a visual artist. I'm going to make work. I'm mm -hmm. going to figure out how to support myself and sustain my family or whoever through making this work. And I think too, like there, there's such a vulnerability that comes from being an artist. Like you're giving so much of yourself to the audience and you're putting so much of yourself and your own feelings and identity into your work. I, I would think in a way that most careers, you don't do that. Um, most careers mm -hmm. are not quite as personal and vulnerable. And, you know, like you don't have to be your authentic self every time you show up to the canvas or, you know, to whatever. Um, and so I think, you know, like this isn't something that I realized when I first started becoming friends with a lot of artists. But I think like over time, I kind of recognize those characteristics in the artists that I knew. And I think that's part of what draws me to them. Like their courage makes me more courageous. Their vulnerability mm -hmm. makes me feel comfortable being more vulnerable um not just with them but in general in life and so yeah I do have like most of my friends I would say are probably like artists and curators um and curators kind of have a similar mentality I mean like there are spaces for us to work you know full-time with like salary positions and benefits in a way that a lot of artists don't have outside of teaching but there's still like that vulnerability that comes from curating like there's still this creative aspect to our work that we have to present to the world and we could be judged. Like people might not like it or, you know, like there's a lot of courage that you have to have going into these positions. But I think particularly with artists, um, like having that, having that tenacity to like keep going if nobody likes your art in the beginning or you can't, you know, figure out ways to sell it or you can't get into exhibitions, like to, to recognize that this is something that's inside of you that you need to get out. And this is sort of like, a purpose that you feel um, is important in your life, like to, to continue with it when there's not necessarily a structure for you or a platform that you can just kind of jump into and do the work. So I don't know. I just think artists are really interesting and amazing people. I mean, I guess technically I'm an artist, but I don't really identify that way on my own. I make work, but um, it's more for mean? my own pleasure. Um, I well, I started out doing photography. That's what I did most of undergrad. Now I do more like textile pieces. But I told you, I have three kids and a full time job, so I don't right. have a ton of time for it. But that's right. what I'm most interested in. I learned how to do quilt making a few years ago. Um, when my my oldest was really young, I started making things for her dolls. So I started oh. making quilts and like doll clothing and and little dolls and stuff. But um, and my you know my practice has definitely shifted from like child-centered <laughs> but it's definitely something that I do because I enjoy it like I don't have any interest in exhibiting um I'm not super interested in other people necessarily seeing it unless they come to my house but it's something that I feel like uh is kind of an outlet for me like I need that creative space which I think most people need a creative space and I also like to cook and like to bake like there are different ways that you can be creative but um but that's one way that I do it yeah yeah absolutely I think um so it's funny you said photography because <clears throat> one of our prized possessions is a um, is a photo of my husband's grandmother, who at the time she was already elderly and she went to um, the senior citizen center during the day, and mm -hmm. she was always that lady who she didn't want to be necessarily associated with the seniors. She was helping out the staff, right? So she was there. She was there to help out the staff. Her name was uh, Cornelia Orridge and she was there to help mm -hmm. out the staff. And so one day they had a photographer apparently who came 
there, some some guy, I have his name somewhere, um, and he was a photographer and he came to the um, Senior Citizen Center and he wanted to take some of the pictures of the people. And some of the people were a little leery about letting him take their picture and whatever, but my um, grandmother-in-law, Miss Orridge said, oh no, he could take my picture. So he took her picture and then, you know, a month or so later, I don't know how long it was, he came back and he said, if I, if you let me take your pictures, I'll, I'll give you one of them. And so when I tell you it is the, it, it is just a prized possession. It is wonderful. The things that you can bring out with photography mm -hmm. uh, are amazing. It was, it's better than any, in my opinion, any portrait that could have been taken or whatever. It is her in a just totally and it's going to be a part of the um exhibition also that jessica's putting together the gaze because mm -hmm. she is looking straight on and you can see all the way to her soul and she can see all the way through yours kind of thing mm -hmm. so i love people who do um do photography i think that it is it, probably the most it's so intimate like you said it opens you up it has mm -hmm. to open you up because if you're gonna get the subject to open up, you've got to give them something back too. Cause I, yeah. and I could see the exchange. I could see the interchange in that picture, what he was giving her and what she gave back because she was looking directly, you know, into the person who took the painting. So I, I took mm -hmm. the picture. So I think that's great that um, yeah. you do that. And as a young mom, I know you do need some, you know, some <laughs> outlets other than, other than working your children. Yeah. 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 Too. Well, I think that's great. I, I think this image that you're talking about is definitely something that I would consider legacy, like an important part of your life um, yes. and her life. And, yes. you know, um, I think that's another beauty in in figurative work. Like when you paint or photograph or sculpt an actual person, like that artwork lives beyond them. You know, when they pass on and they're not here anymore, that artwork is still here. And so they yeah. still sort of have a presence on earth. And I think that's really interesting. Um, but I unfortunately have another meeting to get to. And a hard yeah, this was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this was a huge pleasure for me. I love, um, you know, meeting you and getting to talk to you and hearing about not just your collection, but, you know, your thinking behind it. Like, I feel like you're so intentional about um, making your space beautiful you yes. know, like collecting work because you're interested in it, but also to support artists. I think that's really important. Yes. Um, so this has been a huge pleasure for me. I would love to talk to you again. I could talk to you forever. You know, I feel like we could go on and on based on how the conversation's gone. But um, yeah, if we'll I'm ever- We'll have lunch for real. We'll have lunch yeah, for real. Yeah, I was going to say, if yeah. I'm ever in your area, yeah, for sure. I'll definitely make sure that Jessica connects us so we can have lunch. Please do. Talk more. Please do. Yeah. I, if, you, if you ever come to the Mint Museum, I literally live uptown. I live right across the street from the Uptown Mint Museum. So okay. if you ever come, you will, you will be in my neighborhood. Well, maybe and I'll it, come when the exhibit opens to see it. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Okay. I wish you would. I wish you would. All right. Yeah. Loved it. All right. You yeah. have a good rest of your Great afternoon. To meet you. Okay. All right. You Bye. too. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right.